Hi, this is Dominic Candelaro in the Casa Italia Espresso Zoom meeting. Uh, we're here at Casa Italia today in the library. Uh, we have a group uh, putting together the uh, Italian Americana painting that uh, uh, Carla Simonini is the editor of Italian Americana, and we're helping her to get the product out into the mail. Our guest today is Joe Raina. Joe is from St. Louis. He has a, a very interesting family history, and he has written it down. Uh, he, Joe is not a writer, at least he wasn't a writer until recently. He's more of a business man, but uh, he uh, has a great deal to say about the Italian Americans, his family, St. Louis, Chicago, and uh, other places. Uh, Joe's book, The Goat Sleeps in the Kitchen, was published recently, and where he's here to do a presentation based on it. Uh, some of the people who are in the book are also in our audience today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe Ray, the author of The Goat Sleeps in the Kitchen. Hey, Joe. Hey, Dominic. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. I first want to thank you, Dominic. This is a very nice gesture on your part. And I, I think it bears mentioning that uh, we met through a very mutual friend, Leonard Amari, uh, in the fall of 2019. I had just completed the manuscript to my book before they started rewriting it. And you were kind enough to spend four or five hours with me uh, at Casa Italia, and we went to lunch after that, and um, we've been in contact a lot ever since. Um, next, I, I make it a point not to waste anybody's time, especially mine, and I'm going to do my best to keep this short and sweet without getting into a lot of detail. Uh, my mother was an unusual woman or I never would have written this book. She lived to be 97. And the beginning of the story takes place in a small town in Sicily, in the middle of nowhere, very small. My mother um, only went to the second grade. My father, who I refer to as the scoundrel in the book, uh, never went to school at all. He was eight years from, older. You're from Castel Termini. Right. Yeah, they were in Casta Termini, uh, which is about 25 miles from a, the port city of Agrigento. Oh, Agrigento. Right. And... Um, when she was 12, she had an older sister two years, a younger sister five years, and a baby brother. My grandmother passed away in pneumonia. My, my grandfather was working in a coal mine in Alabama for 10 cents an hour, sending money home, living in a boarding house. There were no jobs in this small town. There was a, uh, at the time, a sulfur mine, but they didn't work very often. My mother learned how to make bread and pasta at a very early age. And at age 12, she took over the family. They lived in a house that dated back three generations. There was a stove to cook on, but no oven. She would bake her bread and walk up to the corner bakery and they would, out of kindness, would bake her bread a couple of times a week. She was beautiful, blonde and blue eyed. And her name was Maria Insalaco. And it started, the problem started for her and my father 
when she was 16, he started literally stalking her whenever he would see her walk into the bakery and tried to get, uh, get her to agree to marry him, which she refused to do. I'm about to tell you the beginning. That's a true story told to me by her directly. And one night, because there was no indoor plumbing, she's throwing the water out from the pasta. They ate pasta every night. And my father's two sister-in-laws threw a shawl over her head and literally dragged her to my uncle Luigi's house where my father was staying with two other brothers and the two women that kidnapped my mother. During the course of the evening, trying to persuade her to marry my father and her constant refusal she was given two warnings, the first of which was, we're gonna keep you here all night because when people see you leaving in the morning, they're gonna assume you slept with, you slept with uh, my brother-in-law. She said, I don't care. At which time my uncle Luigi made a statement. We know where your father's working, marry my brother. You don't wanna be an orphan. That's a true story. She agreed. And eight or nine months later, they were married. She had a select group of friends and family members who literally did not associate with anybody else at that wedding. She refused to dance with my father. She told my father, I don't know how to dance. She got pregnant the first year and lost twins at, at birth. She got pregnant later again and she miscarried in the seventh month. In the third year, she had a baby boy. He lived seven months and he died. And my father gave her grief because she did not blame her for not bearing him an heir. At a wedding in 1913, now remember this is, this is a remote town. There's no electricity. They're at a wedding lit by candlelight. Again, a true story told by my mother. My father was dancing with a young girl and according verbatim, he had his hands in the wrong place at one point. And the girl's brother approached my father and got into an argument. And the father of the bride approached both of them and said, take your fight outside. Don't ruin my daughter's wedding. When they went outside, the guy was bigger than my dad. And he struck first. And my father, who always carried a knife, stabbed him three times. Now there's no doctor and no hospital in this tiny town. Assuming the guy died or was going to die, the next part of the story, all I know is somehow, some way, they got him to Agrigento, changed his name on some papers, and as a stowaway, he got on a ship eventually and ended up in a small town in Southern Illinois where his older brother was working in a coal mine. As a boarder in a tiny three room house owned by the coal company. There were two rooms, two bedrooms and a tiny room where they would eat. The kitchen was outside. The stove to cook on was outside under a lean-to. Two years later, he sends for my mother. She arrives to this dismal, miserable little town. No stores, no services. A guy would come with a horse and wagon every Saturday to deliver a grocery order for 
most of the people living in the town. When my mother arrived, the, that first Saturday, she told the guy, bring me the biggest sack of flour you can find, bring me eggs, and bring me a goat. There was no refrigeration, no electricity. She wanted the goat for milk. She had an incredible work ethic. My dad did too. He was, he was willing to break his back, but that coal mine was only paying him 10 cents an hour. Some, some weeks, he would get three days, four days. In that shack they lived in, my older sister was born in 1916. There were two boarders living in that other room. Eventually, a second birth, my brother, in 1918. And the, the boarders had to leave. 1920, a third child was born, my sister. All three of them slept there. There was no school in the town. Everybody was speaking the old Sicilian dialect. And finally, my mother convinced my father to move to the next town, which was Marion, Illinois, another coal mining town. My father was buying a gallon of homemade wine for 50 cents and consuming it within a week. Some weeks, he was only bringing home three or four dollars. Meanwhile, because it's been asked many times, what about the goat? That goat in the wintertime slept in the kitchen, hence the title of my book. My mother was reading, and she got a book about how to make wine. And she convinced my father to start making some wine with raisins. And they started selling the wine for 50 cents a gallon to the miners to survive. Prohibition had come in. They didn't know they were breaking the law. As the story progresses, a fourth child was born in 1923, another boy. And the economics of trying to make it got worse. And one day, my father brings a guy home on a Sunday, and he makes a proposition to my mother. That proposition was to get on a train, which was about a 30 minute ride, and hook up with some people from the hill and return with a five gallon can of alcohol. God knows what proof. They would take that alcohol and cook sugar and water. And that five gallons became 30 gallons or 40 gallons. We don't know. And she started making that run every week. And they rewarded her with $5. I had an aunt living in the town. She would drop the kids off, get on that train and make her run. And soon my aunt, who also lost the baby while she was there, moved to St. Louis. My older sister was in school and my mother would take three kids and get on that train and make that run. And one day she steps off the train and the police are there and they haul her into the jail. The kids are crying. She leaves them in the lobby of the, of the jail 
and goes in front of a sergeant, she doesn't hardly understand anything he's saying. Finally, he brings another Italian guy in and does the translation. And my mother looks at him and says, okay, you wanna put me in jail? You gotta put my three kids in jail with me. And they let her go. She had a very entrepreneurial mind. And as the story progresses, they ultimately end up in St. Louis which was her goal all along. When she was making those runs with that five gallon can, the head of that group had a grocery store. That grocery store enabled him to buy all the sugar he wanted. And they used that sugar on several locations on the hill to make alcohol. There's a story that's a testament to her that uh, they were making, she was making moonshine with my dad on the second floor of a house they were in and they got busted by the feds. My father ended up doing six months in, at Leavenworth. During that six months, Two different groups, a barber, great friend of ours, who was married to my mother's first cousin, and two brother-in-laws of my father got a black hand letter demanding money. And they went to my mother. The barber went to my mother and the two family members went to my mother. She sent a cable to my uncle Luigi. We know he was connected in some way. It was never proven. I don't get into it in the book. But he had the names of the two guys that signed it, that sent that black hand letter. Their names were not on the letter. And my uncle checked into their family members in three different towns and sent a cable back to my mother. And my mother, through the two in-laws, set up a meeting to meet the two guys who had sent the black hand letter. They arranged to meet at the, at the barber shop on a Sunday. Again, this story was told to me by my mother. There were three brothers on the in-laws. They picked my mother up. She got in the back seat of a car. The one brother who was driving had a pistol. The guy in the front seat had a machine gun and the other brother in the back seat had a pistol and they went for a confrontation. First, my mother went into the barber shop. The, the three brothers sat in the car, ready to blast in there if there was a problem. The two guys from the Black Hand walked in the barber shop, sat at a table facing the front door with their pistols on the table. And my mother got in their face and showed them the cable. That cable had their family members on it. And she told them if anything happens to the barber, if anything happens to the three brothers, their families, your family in Sicily will get nailed. 1930, my father was working for the city of St. Louis. He got laid off. Now there's five kids. The fifth boy, his name was Joseph, was born in 1927. And my mother went to work 
for a laundry for $8 a week with five kids. She worked her way up and became the head of the seamstress department. And she learned she was now making $14. This is now 1933, 34. And she learns there were two men making one $18 and the other $20 a week and she's working for 14. And she's out working them. And she goes to the guy who ran, this, this was a tremendous business. They were running six days a week, 24, uh, 24 hours a day, three shifts. My older sister was working there. My mother went to the boss and she said, you know, I'm sewing more than those two guys and they're making more money than me. Why? And he gave her an excuse that he hired them when things were good and they were Italian tailors, actual Italian tailors. And with a smile ear to ear, she said, well, you know, it's your business. You can pay him whatever you want. I just don't think it's fair. And she got up to leave and the guy said, wait a minute, sit down. And he gave her a raise. She was determined not to depend on my father for anything. We're, we're in the depression. It's 1934, 22% unemployment. And one day there was a small, tiny little grocery store, maybe four, five, 600 square feet down the street from where they lived. And she learned that store was for sale. The man who had been running had died. His wife, no offense, she didn't have a brain in her head. I met that woman later in life. She didn't know how to run that store. My mother went to see her. And she said to her, I want to buy your store. The lady looks at her and says, you got any money? She says, yeah, I got $25. The lady laughed at her. My mother started laughing. As I said in the book, here are two women in the middle of the worst depression in the history of the United States trying to buy and sell a business without any money. It was comical, but she bought the store. She didn't know how to run a store, but she had a good common street sense. And over the ensuing five years, she really built the business. She, she expanded the type of inventory they were carrying. She taught herself how to butcher meat. She created sandwiches. The kids were growing up. They were helping in the store. In November of 1939, with a month to go on her lease. She had been paying that woman $25 a month, $300 a year for $1,500 to buy the business. The last payment was due. And the lady walked in, said, I gotta talk to you. Your lease is up next month. I want the store back. She knew the business had been growing. My mother went into a rage. They had to separate them. My brother, my one brother was there and my older sister was sweeping the floor in the grocery store. My sister Josie arrived from work. She was working at a department store. And they sat around a table and Josie had the patience of Job. She calmed everything down. My mother told about a store, a vacant store up the street. It had been vacant since 1920. This is 1939. 
It was in a building that had a store next door. It was a dry goods store there and two flats upstairs. She went to see the guy that was a Jewish guy that owned the dry goods store. He knew her. And she asked about the vacant store. He said, it was a tavern in 1920. It's owned, the building's owned by Anheuser-Busch. A couple of days later with my other brother, she goes down to Anheuser-Busch on the bus. And um, having just mentioned my older brother, I, ha I have to stop for a minute. Because in 1935, my brother Joseph, who was eight, was playing with a group of boys in what used to be the city dump, surrounded by a sewerage system. And it had rained heavily for a few days and this sewer system was an open ravine, concrete. It was used primarily and actually circled the entire city of St. Louis to help solve flooding. We don't know exactly how, we know somebody accidentally pushed Joseph. He went flying down the ravine, landed in water, and drowned. And I'm named after him. So she goes down to Anheuser Bush in December 1939. And the head of the real estate department for the United States for Anheuser Bush was a man named Brown, B R A U N. And Mr. Brown looks at her and says, what kind of business do you want to put in that store? She said, I want to put a grocery store. In. He looks at her and he says, lady, we sell beer. She said, I'll sell your beer. He looks at her with a smile on his face and says, and how are you going to cool it? People want cold beer. In those days, there were no liquor stores selling cold beer. Grocery stores didn't sell beer. There was a tavern, especially on the hill, there was a tavern almost every corner. He tries to convince her to put a tavern in there. And she said, there was a tavern across the street. There's one down the street. He said, lady, I'm sorry. We want a tavern in there. She was undaunted. She left got back on the bus, got my older brother on the side when she got home and said, go find me some way to cool beer, either a used refrigerator or a cooler, anything. Took him a few days and he found a huge cooler, big enough you could walk into the thing. By the way, this store was six times bigger than the store she was leaving. There were four rooms upstairs. They too were vacant. She had inquired with the Jewish guy next door. He was paying 45 a month. Well, she had been paying 50 a month, counting 25 a month for the previous store. So 45 didn't scare her. So Joe, a lot of what you're saying could be used in uh, business classes as case studies <laughs> as to uh, how one gets ahead. Well, that's where I'm going with this story because the part about her uh, regarding what she did is, is that in, pretty much comes up in the next eight years. But, but to, to cut to the chase, my brother found the cooler. He put a small deposit down on it. She went back down to see this guy, showed him the receipt for the deposit on the cooler. And he agreed to lease her the store for $50 a month. And with a smile from ear to ear, she looked at him and said, why should I pay 50 when the guy next door is paying you 45 for the same, same store? He laughed at her and said, okay, I'll let you have the store for 45. 
So here's a woman with a second grade education negotiating with the head of the real estate department for the largest brewery in the world. And in the ensuing years in that store, her mind never rested. World War II came along. I don't know every detail. I put what details I knew into the book. But in 1942, December Christmas dinner, sitting around the table, I remember I was there. She makes an announcement and she's gonna buy that property. My older brother, Carlo, almost lost it. He said, mom, are you crazy? When this war, they were in World War II. When this war is over, we'll be right back in the depression. All these people that have been put back to work, they're, they're making stuff for the war. Don't be serious. How much do they want for this building? It's not just a store. It's the two stores, the two flats, and a half a block of land behind the building. She said $11,000. And he says, where are you going to get $11,000? She said, Anheuser-Busch is going to finance the deal with 10% down. And where are you going to get $1,100? She was looking at him the whole time because she knew he was going to be throwing rain on in clouds over the whole deal. My older sisters were there. My other brother was there. She gets up and goes in the room next door where she slept, reached under her bed and comes back with a shoebox. And she dumps 11 rubber band $100 on the table. Yeah, Joe, we're having a little problem with your uh, sound. If you lean into the mic a little bit. Okay, out. got it. Okay, so they went down, they went down to see Mr. Brown and dropped off the 1100 and he had bad news. The federal government in order to stem inflation had put all kinds of restrictions on anything you bought on credit. And he, she was told she was $1,100 sharp. She needed 2250 and again, undone it. She went back, when they walked in the store, my sister Josie standing there, my other brother standing there, and they knew something was wrong. She walked down the street, one block, there was a bank owned by Sicilian people. Pleaded her case. And they gave her a check for $1,100 on her signature. A woman in 1942 borrowing money on her signature. I dare say there are banks today that if some woman who could barely speak English walked into their bank and asked to borrow money on her signature, they would tell her hit the road. She bought the store. She was determined to pay that store off within a couple of years, even though she had a five-year note. And she did that. That store was a monumental success. Everything that was thrown at her during this whole period from 1915 until 1948, when she sold the store and sold the business, she did not sell the building everything that was thrown at her, she met it head on. There was no stopping her. And um, she okay, passed no, that's away. A great story. Go ahead, Dominic, that's, go ahead. That's a great story. Uh, and of course, you know, feminism is certainly important and the uh, study of women's lives and women's history 
uh, has been neglected, especially among you know, the Italian Americans, where uh, their society was pretty much male dominated. Uh, so your mother is uh, unusual uh, because of what she accomplished, but maybe not as that unusual. Uh, I think that um, mostly uh, women ran the household finances, the day-to-day -day household finances. A uh, husband gave them the check uh, and uh, they decided how uh, they, it was gonna be spent. And, Let me stop you for a minute though, Dominic. You just made a statement. The husband gave them the check. There was no checks. There was no checks. He never made, he never made more than four or five dollars a week his entire life. And, and in 1930, after that, he never worked again. So she, mm -hmm. if you study you know, what books were written at the early part of the 20th century, they were about men. Women stayed home and had babies, 10 and 12 yeah. and kids, okay? This, she didn't have that luxury. She, she didn't have that luxury. She, she, had to, she, had to, she had to do things to survive. And mm -hmm. you know, if you sit down and analyze this book, um, what she accomplished was not only feeding us, she brainwashed us, all of us, every one of her kids inherited her generosity, her entrepreneurial skills. Um, we, we, there was no stopping us, none of us. Did, did they, you ever use the term furbo to describe uh, what, uh, what we should be like in terms of the business acumen? Furbo. No, no, never heard it. Oh, you have to do this too, don't you? <laughs> I don't know, something like that. No, I dominate. Anyhow, uh, cunning, I guess, is the word. And uh, Yeah, that's a good word. She was very cunning. She, she was. Yeah. She was. So, uh, uh, yeah, you've given us a really good uh, uh, recitation of uh, the narrative of the book. I, I don't think we should go any further because maybe... Uh, You'll give away the all of the book and the people won't want to read it, but it's a fascinating read. And it's back up the general thesis about Italian Americans and how they worked hard and over two or three generations they made good, they all made it into the middle class. This is an overgeneralization, I know, but it's a general uh endorsement of the American system uh, and of capitalism and all that, that uh, we are a uh, uh, an ethnic group that you can put on a pedestal that proves how good America is. Now, there are other ethnic groups that, that and their treatment has been uh, uh, characterized in a, a totally different way. America has failed them, supposedly. And uh, so I don't know what your feelings are on that. You know, Dominic, just a testimonial to the whole thing was her and all of us. Um, between August of, um, I'm sorry, between July uh, of 1991, after a year after she passed away, I was in St. Louis. It was my sister, Virginia, my older sister's 84th birthday. And we're down in my sister Josie's nicely finished basement kitchen. And Virginia and I and Josie are going over a lot of stories about her. And I said, you know, if we don't write some of this down, our kids and our grandkids are never gonna know these stories about her and what an extraordinary person she was. We started writing. By Sunday night, we filled over 50 pages of notes. I took that home, took it to Chicago. I made an outline. I gave that outline to three different family members. 
including a cousin of mine. He's a great guy. I love him dearly. But nobody picked up on it. Mm -hmm. It sat in a file in my office until the summer of 2019. And on three different occasions, including my nephew, Joe Mocha, who's listening here, I was told, you got to write the book. Mm -hmm. I started oh, interviewing, I started interviewing uh, various writers, all of whom had written books, including you. As I recall, you have written 11 books. I'm talking about writers, authors who published books. I was told by everybody, including you, you're probably gonna to have to publish this book, self-publish on Amazon. You know what? Don't tell me that. I had her determination. Yeah. I finally found a publisher who would listen to me and who would read my manuscript. And they've agreed to pub they agreed to publish this book. Good for you. And I have since written a second book called Italy Under My Skin, because I've been to Italy 42 times. Wow. Okay. And I've also written a third book. It's a fiction story. And they've okay. agreed to they've agreed to publish both of those. They're both they're both at the editorial stage right now. So that's my mother. So uh, I think that's a good place to uh, move on to ask if there's some questions from the participants and uh, uh, you can uh, do wave your arms or uh, uh, unmute yourself or whatever and uh, we'll get to some questions. Anybody want to be first? Uh, uh, may, may I, Dominic? Okay, sure. Oh. Joe, your story is wonderful. Um, your mother is quite a personage, a real character. Um, you described her as having, barely having second grade education. My grandmother had third grade and she could recite the divine comedy. God bless her and God bless your mom. I'm a school principal, and that is something very rare nowadays. So this comes to the question, second grade, but what was it? Like uh, a master's degree in those times. And uh, my question for you, uh, besides compliments for your storytelling, is how much and how far did your mother's storytelling influence you in becoming a storyteller of this kind? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think it was her influence for me to tell a story. My mother was a great salesperson. And I think if I inherited anything from her regarding telling a story, it's, I've been a salesman all my life. So I, inher I inherited, I mean, she was able to convince a bank. If you, know, if you read the book, you will see, she went to that bank a half a dozen times from 1934 to 19, till she bought the building. And they never turned her down one time. She was able to sell them that she could do, do whatever she told him she was going to do. But it's not only that. She convinced the people that she was doing business with in that store to give her credit so that she could buy merchandise. Um, my two brothers, same story. Great salespeople. My two sisters, great business people. My, my sister, Josie, went to work for an insurance company primarily to get health insurance when her second boy who's listening to this went to high school. She went to work for 80, $80 $90 a week 
as a file clerk in the claims department. She only went one semester of high school, one semester. And she ended up running that claims department, making big money and climbed her way up to the point that one day the head of that company, this is General American Life, had her rewrite the manual for claims. She appealed to them one time because I had a sister-in-law who had committed herself. She was a drunk. My sister learned that my brother had to pay that bill. She was in that hospital for three months. My sister appealed to her bosses that alcoholism is a disease and we need to pay people when they commit themselves and go into a hospital. They passed her wishes and every insurance company in, the, in America, I don't know about the world, every insurance company in America later started paying claims for alcoholism. Okay, it's, we all got it from her. We, we don't have enough time today to discuss, it's in the book. A lot of it, what happened with my siblings is in the book. Joe, uh, thank you. I didn't see much of the mention of religion in your book. Uh, what uh, was the religious? Uh, we, we, were, we were Catholic. We were Catholic, Dominic. But uh, there are no pr priests uh, that mentioned that I can remember. And, Dominic, there, uh, is a, there is a priest. That's a good question. There's a priest on the hill from the time he took over until he died. There was a priest at St. Ambrose Church. His name was Lupo. Oh, yeah. Okay? So he ruled with an iron fist. He handled all the marriages. He handled all the baptisms because he got the gratuity he would not share that with the other priests. And one day, a Paisani from Karstatermini, whose husband was sick, he hadn't worked in a while, she had two kids, she went to see Father Lupo, looking for some financial help. He gave her a dime, 10 cents. It's still the middle of the depression. My mother was still struggling. That store didn't over, hit a home run overnight. He went, she went to see my mother crying and told my mother, I don't have any food to feed my family. My mother filled two large grocery bags full of groceries and enough food for at least two weeks and gave it to her. Mm. So there isn't a lot about the church in the 30s, I can tell you that. There was an organization of people from Costa Tamini. Yeah. It's in the, the stories in the book. If you got sick and you didn't have any work, you could go and if you belong to the organization, they would help support you until you, your husband got back to work. The Sojita. Uh, yeah. The Costa Tamini. That seemed to be more active than uh, other uh, mutual benefit societies that are, I've heard of. How many members do you uh, think? Oh, that, uh, that there's, there's a picture in the book. There are probably, I'm going to guess, probably 250, 300 people. Yeah, well, that's a pretty big societe. <clears throat> Joe, question. Yes. So Joe, can you hear me? Joe Castellano from Dayton, Ohio with my wife. Hi, Joe. Good to How see you? you. Good to Good see to you. See Great, you. Joe. You know, we've been in touch. The book is absolutely fantastic. I, I, I told you that you, you you did a service not only to your mother, but to all of us who really uh, uh, just never knew some of these stories. It's just fantastic. My my Obviously, your mother sold the store to my Uncle Sam, Romola. Right. And his brother yeah. Carlo, right. they they didn't know anything about 
meat cutting, the grocery business. Did your mother basically mentor them? Oh, yeah. They, that's yeah. what I thought. I mother, thought she ended up mentoring them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have to understand, Santa Rumbolo was my mother's closest friend along with, along with your grandmother. Yes, yeah. Anna. Okay. And no, your, uh, uh, your grandmother was Nunzio, right? Anutza, yes. Anutza. Anutza, right. yeah, right. Okay. So she was good friends, and so was Zapapina, your aunt. She was your aunt, right? Yep. Josepina was your aunt. Okay. So when they sold the store, Carlo and Sam didn't know a thing about, not only about, about cutting meat, they didn't understand anything at all about about uh, running the business. Right. So for the first six months, either my mother or my brother Carlo were there. Not every day, every minute, but anytime there was a problem, we were living upstairs. Yep. Anytime there was a problem, they were down there. So, right. yeah. it. Uh, you know, you read the book. Right. You, yeah. you read the book. Um, and it's, there's not enough time here to really get into the book, but some of the stories about her and the family. Listen, the, the rendezvous um, at least once a month at either your family's house or the other Castellanos house or at the Rumbelow's house or at our house, they were classic. Yep. Everybody brought something. You know, we, we, we didn't know we were broke. <laughs> we weren't poor. We weren't poor. Yeah. But but the, the the thing that's incredible to me that needs mention. You were a professor, correct? Correct. And and you are you are second generation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tuffy. Tuffy I was the first was one in the I was the first one in the Castellano family to go to college. Right. I was the first okay. one. Yeah. Right. And then and then. What about the Canetto boys? Yeah. Yeah. They, they were the first to go to college. Right. Um, it, it, the, the entire group of the clan is a story in itself. Just the clan could be a story. I, 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 I tell this in my next book that the Castellanos Canettos have this annual reunion. Yeah. Um, uh, Carmen Castellano sent an email, which you also added to it. Right. 71 names, 71 right. descendants of the original clan. Right. And there's got to be four generations, probably. Yes. Probably. At least. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I got a call. I don't know if he's, if he's in, with us. I got a, I got a call. Uh, from Peter Rumbelow. Yep. Never met him. Never met him. He read the book. We've been communicating back and forth. And, you know, he tells a story that when his, when, when Carlo, I got to love him, when he passed away, when his father passed away, he didn't have a lot of money. And, and Peter went on to become a, a doctor. Yes. Surgeon. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a tribute to what we grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, this is yeah. Joe, Joe Castellano's wife in Dayton, Ohio. I want to say something. When I read this book, it brought me such joy to know about the family. I'm not Italian. And uh, it just brought me such joy. And I want to say this. Joe, your mother is our family saint. Any of us who have a problem, you need to ask Maria to pray for us and she will help us out you know she's a a, a a loved family member thank you joe for writing it thank you well, that's quite an endorsement quite an endorsement uh, joe you were on the hill in 1950 when that uh, uh soccer team the u.s soccer team was yeah i knew i knew every uh, one of those guys yeah, uh, that's an interesting story because the um, at that time, 
the United States originally was not going to be in the World Cup. And some guy, I believe in New Jersey, decided to try to put a team together. And uh, he crisscrossed the United States. Well, the heel, man, we had some great soccer players. And he recruited six guys from the hill. Four of them started. And uh, at the time, England was destined to win it all. And their second game, they were in South America. Their second game was against England. They, they didn't have a chance. And all through the first half, um, the game was scoreless. I think at the end of the first half or early part of the second half, the United States scored a goal. And then they held them off until almost the end of the game. And some guy from England broke away, was heading right, right to Frank Borgie, who was the goalie. The, the referee was Italian. And there was a guy from the hill, one of the four guys that started in that game, his name was Charlie Colombo. He was fast. And the, he started chasing that guy who had the ball and had control of the ball. And that referee said in Italian, tackle him in Italian. <laughs> and Charlie, Charlie tackled the guy. They got a penalty. They kicked the penalty and Frank Borgi stopped it. But I knew every one of those guys, Frank Borgi, Mike Montani, Pee Wee Wallace, Charlie Colombo, Johnny Barali, Gino Periani, all good friends, great guys. They were older. They were, you know, maybe four, five, six years older than me, but they, they held off England. They knocked England out of it. Yeah, that's a true story, Dominic. There was a movie made about it. Yeah, the game of their lives. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I recommend it. I recommend it. It's a positive movie about Italians not uh, in organized crime. Dominic, let, let's take just a minute. Let's just take a minute about something because some people don't know about this. Um, Stanley Tucci, the actor, started a couple weeks ago a program that's on, there's six segments on CNN. And he started, the first one is in uh, Naples and primarily centers around pizza. And there's a, there's a chef who's the only Michelin star uh, pizza chef greets him. And they go to, a, after he strolls, the, after he strolls Naples a little bit with a, with a lady who's a guide, uh, they head to a place uh, outside of the city where they make buffalo mozzarella. And they, he watches them make some mozzarella. From there, they go to a, a farm in San Marzano. And he talks about tomatoes from San Marzano. Next, they go back to Naples and the pizza guy makes a pizza. And he closes the hour by visiting a guy on the Amalfi Coast who has created this incredible bakery for desserts using lemons. Quite an mm -hmm. interesting story. So much so that I watched it twice. And then last Sunday, he goes to Rome. And in Rome, almost everything revolves around pasta. Now, I don't want to toot my own horn here, but I am going to tell you this. My book about Italy gets into details of almost every trip we took about our business part of it, because I did, I was doing two businesses in Italy during those years from 1930 until 1918. 
and I tackle the San Marzano tomatoes with details. First of all, I'm sure he's gonna be in the next four segments and I suggest everybody to watch it because it is really done well. He's gonna be talking primarily about food, but Italy is a lot more than food. It's a lot more than food. And those of you who have been there know what I'm talking about. Um, I just, I, I just can't, I mean, if it, was, if it was up to me, I gotta be honest, I'd be sitting in a beautiful villa somewhere in Tuscany. I wouldn't be living in this country anymore. I don't like what's going on in this country, especially in politics. And I don't wanna get into that, but there's no country in the world like it, nowhere. And I've been all over this world. Okay, uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, Giuseppe Di Bartolo, che uh, Just a minute. Oh, thank you, Dominic. Oh, um, I was, uh, I say the congratulations to Joe for this uh, extraordinary story. And, uh, I, and this story up to me uh, shows the importance of the micro story in order to build the social history of the Italian emigration to United States. You know, and uh, you, Joe, uh, thank you to have written this uh, beautiful, extraordinary story of your mother. Your mother, I think, was uh, a, a, a woman, very strong, very intelligent, that uh, at that time could see the future, the, the, the event of the, the year ahead. And I, I am, I, I, I would like to read your, your book anyway. Grazie molte. Uh, do we, do we many? Where are you from? I now I stand, Cosenza, Calabria. Calabria, Calabresi sono, huh? Yeah. Uh, and your, your, I, your mother, the name was uh, uh, in Salacco. In Salacco? Si. Si. Uh, uh, from Agrigento, I think. No, no, from Casta Termini, vicino di Agrigento. Ah, vicino di Cast sì. Castelvetrano, no? Sì, ma, ma uh, 20, 20 km. Ah, oh, oh, sì. vicino, vicino di Agrigento. Vicino a Agrigento, sì, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ok. And uh, I was also in this thing, in, uh, you say, in 1916, 1920, 1923, in your family, there uh, was uh, the the the, mort, uh, the uh, infant mortality rate was very high at that time yes yeah this yes. in See. that time the mortality rate infant See. mortality rate was was uh, normal in, for that time um, if you uh, think the condition the sanitary, sanitary condition of uh, italy at that time it was terrible. It was terrible, yeah. 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 Grazie molte. <laughs> was a uh, pleasure for me, eh? Any other questions? I'll start calling on you soon. My favorite is Lou Cairo. Lou Cairo. Lou Corsino. What's your take on this story, Lou? 
Can I get here? Mike, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Is it okay if I disagree with you, Dominic? Um, uh, well, plenty of people do, uh, especially my wife. <laughs> uh, I was listening to Joe's story, and you said uh, that it's an example of how Italian Americans were so successful and the like. But I think the point is, is that Joe's story is exceptional. I think his mother's exceptional. I think his mother, as we heard, his mother was a saint uh, in, in some ways. Uh, I don't think as, as wonderful and as a model that Joe's mother and family is, as a model, uh, I don't think it characterizes the typical Italian who came here uh, and who existed here. And so I'm, I'm interested in the gap between how, what Joe's mother and family was done through all the sort of issues she had to deal with, how she was able to keep going, while the typical Italian would have probably, typical Italian American, like the typical American woman or man, would have, would have, wouldn't have done as much. So, I mean, what is it that she had that differentiated her from the typical Italian who was, wasn't successful? Uh, it was their grandchildren who were successful. The typical Italian lived tough lives here until, the, until World War II and, and onwards. Does that make sense? Yeah, let me, let me share a quick story about her that is in the book. Mm -hmm. so, so she gets approached and she knew where the approach was coming from. She gets approached by a guy one day and this is in the 20s and uh, they're living in St. Louis and he has a house that he wants her and my father to start making moonshine. Mm -hmm. And um, again, you know, he wasn't, he just wasn't bringing home any money, but they knew this was coming from the guy that had the grocery store and indirectly was involved, okay? So they uproot the family and she moves the family to the, into this guy's house and they set up the still. And the guy agreed to pay her. He was gonna make the moonshine during the day. My father at this point was working in a clay mine and um, 15 cents an hour. So he promised her a dollar a gallon. He would make it during the day and she and my dad are gonna make it at night. So they make the first hundred gallons and it doesn't taste good at all. He agrees to pay her. He says, Maria, don't worry about it. Let's get it corrected. Well, by the end of the month, they made a little over 500 gallons and it was all bad. And she asked the guy for the money. He said, no, I lost a lot of money, I'm sorry. My mother went at him. My father was at work. If my father had been there, that guy would have got stabbed. There, there is no doubt about it. Well, she waited till the following Monday. She got dinner ready. She knew that guy at the grocery store and the group met every Monday night. Then she went to the store because she, she knew he closed at six. She knocks on the door. And Mr. John comes to the door, Mrs. Rena, how are you? What, what, what can I do for you? My mother says, is, is so-and-so in there in the back room? He said, yeah, what's the problem? My mother told him the problem. And she said, I'm gonna go in there. I'm gonna look him right in the eye. If he will look me in the eye and deny that he agreed to pay me the $500, then I'll turn around and I'll walk away. But if he won't look me in the eye, I'm going to spit in his face. Now, there was a Mr. Castellano sitting in there who loved my mother. He had a pistol in his pocket. He knew what was coming. 
And if that guy had hit my mother, he would have been dead. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of that's the kind of spunk she had. She she just she just did not take any crap from anybody. She wasn't about to. You you got to go through the fact you know losing five kids. There was no medication. There were no antidepressant drugs. I remember when one Friday night, a dentist removed a third of her teeth. She was in that grocery store. I remember like it was yesterday. She was in that grocery store the next morning with a towel wrapped around her head to keep her mouth shut and to catch any stuff coming out of her mouth, which was bloody. Right back in the grocery store. Um, one last it, question. Anybody else have a question? Or one last one. Who wants to do it? Anybody out there? Wave your hand. Speak up. Unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, Joe, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, very moving, uh, very heartfelt. Uh, and uh, I'd like you to summarize in uh, 30 seconds uh, what this book is all about and what the experience is all about. Uh, Dominic, you know, it's, it's hard to do in 30 seconds and I don't wanna take any more of their time. All I can say is this, all of the net proceeds for this book, and we're selling a lot of books, all of the net proceeds are going 50% to St. Jude and 50% are going to an organization in Phoenix called SARC. They strictly work with people with autism. And I happen to have a 31 year old grandson who's autistic. And um, that's where the proceeds are going. So please spread the word so we can sell some books. Thank you very much. And Dominic, again, thank you. Mille grazie. Oh, thank you. Good luck.